pre-show quid pro quo. Matthew, you get one question. It can be any question in the world. It can be what kind of plants do I have in my house? What's the weather outside? Go ahead and ask. Okay. Well, I, I thought about this uh, leading up to this, and I decided I wanted to get incredibly personal. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Do you have a personal religion other than magic? And if no, do you have at least a particular god that you favor or work with a lot? Uh, no, I do not have a, I, I'm not religious, not in the, uh, the sense of the, the word religion, which is, uh, legere, which means like binding together. So I uh, like church going, I do not have that. Uh, I was baptized, uh, within the United Church of Canada. I disliked church so much that when my parents and my brother would go into church, I would refuse to go inside. So I would sit in our family's car listening to opera like Wagner or Beethoven. It was nice, though, because it was right beside a graveyard. So I'd also just walk around the graveyard. Do I have a personal God? I don't have a holy guardian angel or a, a genius or anything like that. Do I have a God that I go to more than any other? Uh, no. I'm all over the place as far as that kind of stuff is concerned. I use a lot of them. I always dislike the term. Um, I work with a lot of them. I have fun with a lot of them. Mm. I, I think that that's important for people to realize. They, oh, everybody wants to talk about working with gods. So how about just have some fun with the gods themselves? But if there would be one that I would use more than any other, oh, uh, man, probably Anubis. Um, and uh, we'll get into that in in this wonderful episode. But not uh, no, I don't. I'm not religious. I don't have uh, one god that I, I tend to favor above all else. They are uh, mixed in there. So, but great question, uh, Matthew. That's a that's a really good question. <laughs> and, and that's also a term I've never quite got. Is when people are like, "Oh, I work with so and so and so and so and so." It sounds like they're showing up next to you in your cubicle with a briefcase or yeah. something. It's like. It's not an appealing term. I want to work with the spirits. Like, how about you just have fun with them? <laughs> hey, yo! Hey, everybody. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A podcast that reminds you to never use a red oil lamp for scrying ever. In this podcast, we will be talking about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. And in this episode, I have a very special guest. Uh, he is somebody who has reached out to me, uh, probably one of the first people to reach out to me and say that he liked the show. His name is Matthew. Matthew is also a bit of a dabbler in the cult, would you say? Penny Dabbler, going yeah. on a uh, Master of the Mystical Arts. Perfect. Hopefully there we one go. day. <laughs> and, and your jam is heathenry, is it not? If you can, in, uh, give me a, a less than a paragraph description of what heathenry is. Okay, so heathenry is basically the umbrella term for the worship of the Norse slash Germanic gods and spirits. It encompasses everything from Asatru to Odinism to, I can't pronounce it, but the Anglo-Saxon heathenry and so on. It's just when you say you're a heathen, it encompasses all of that. And I don't get any more specific than that. Some people do. Okay, wonderful. That's fantastic. I, again, I want to thank you. I had a couple of guests drop out. I asked, you know, uh, I need somebody. I need, really need somebody. And, and you were the first person that came to mind. So uh, thank you again for, for coming in and doing this. And uh, I'm going to extend an even, me. Yeah, I'm going to extend you an even bigger thank you because you have chosen a topic that I have been absolutely champing at the bit to talk about. It's been on my list for a long, long time. For people that are unfamiliar with the podcast, I give my guests a list of about 25 topics to go through. They get to pick one of those. And then we come together. I do a bit of research beforehand and then we talk about them. If they have any questions, they're welcome to ask. But a lot of people have asked me, like, why even have guests, Doug? You you do a lot of the talking. And I say, think of it as kind of sitting in on a tutoring session, as much fun as that might be. But uh, in this case, Matthew, you have chosen the topic that oh, I just, I'm so excited to talk about. You've chosen the Greek magical papyri. So I'm going to get into a little bit of a story 
here, as I tend to do. So when I first started with magic, I was turned to it through Robert Anton Wilson and Grant Morrison, specifically through a DVD called Disinformation and a lecture on there called Disinfo Nation. Anyway, so I was I was a uh, chaos magician ish for about a year and a half to two years and then something started to happen i started to drift over to the the golden dawn and uh, that kind of ceremonial lodge magic Uh, after that i spent a couple of years going through alistair crowley and then I did some Enochian magic. I was very obsessed with John D, as a lot of people are. Uh, I thought this was more austere than than chaos magic. This everybody was telling me that this was the magic. Oh, that that chaos magic. You're just I don't know. You're using the Rocky Horror Picture Show as gods. Blah. Like that's that's silly. Comic book characters, Superman. Man, who who cares? Uh, this is the actual magic. You gotta you gotta do this stuff. So I and I did. I found that as interesting as it was, it was not very effective. Some of the things that I would do would work, but a lot of the time it would just fall flat as far as putting it into into practical use. Uh, I got a little bit frustrated with this, and eventually I drifted into the more philosophical side of magic, things like Francis Yates or Giordano Bruno, Pico de Mirandola, Marsilio Ficino, basically any of the things that Dan Attrell talks about now. So I became a bit of an armchair magician, and that was where I was for at least the first seven years of my magical proclivities. I got a bit depressed, and there was a lot of frustration that was involved. I was probably drinking too much. Something wasn't right. I, I, I was a definite armchair magician. These things were just ideas to me, the philosophy of magic, and I, I stopped doing the practical stuff. I, I kind of hit a wall, and I basically asked myself, why was I doing this? Why, why am I interested in magic? It's been, it's been one of those things that's so important to me. Why did I get into it? And I started to think, what happened in my past? What, w- what were the things that really attracted me? And so things like Egypt. If you've listened to the episode I did previously about ancient Egyptian magic, you'll know that I have a great love and respect for ancient Egypt. And my father, he was huge into uh, Greek mythology and Greek culture. I, I grew up n- knowing the names. As soon as I could hear the names of these gods and these mythical figures, or even these figures that were real within ancient Greek, Greece. Uh, This was the stuff that I grew up on, Greece and Egypt. So there was not one single thing I can actually point to and say that's where it happened. But somehow I found out about this document called the Greek Magical Papyri. And in a way, it was almost a godsend. It was familiar, again, Greek, Egyptian. So I, I I started looking into it more and more and more and more. And then eventually I, it just became an absolute obsession. It was as if everything just fit together and it was a near perfect thing for me at that period of time in my life. It got me back onto doing practical magic it, like nothing has ever before it. So I would like to say that the Greek magical papyri, it brought, brought me back from the brink. And I adore it. I absolutely love it. And I would like to say that this is probably going to be the first of maybe a couple or at least three episodes on the Greek magical papyri. So with that, what is the Greek magical papyri? Or Papyri Grece Magicae. So if I use the term PGM, that's what it is, the Greek Magical Papyri. It is a body of papyri from Greco-Roman Egypt, written in Greek, but also in Egyptian, Coptic, and Demotic. Uh, do you know what Demotic is, is Matthew? You know, I looked up the term this morning, and I okay. no longer remember. So everybody knows what hieroglyphs are. Hieroglyphs, you see them on the inside of the pyramids or on columns within temples in ancient Egypt. Everybody, every kid knows what they are. It's the, the pictures of animals and, and arms and eyes and stuff like that. Uh, they could read this, right? Well, if they had to take those hieroglyphs and put them onto paper or papyri, which is what they had, uh, this was called hieroglyphs. So from, instead of carved into stone, put onto paper, this was hieratic. And then there was kind of a shorter form of that, and that would have been demotic. So the best way to try and think about it is uh, hieroglyphs would be using a word processor on a computer, 
printing out a piece of paper and it's all nice and like pretty. Hieratic would be writing a note in your hand and being able to hand it to somebody else to read. Demotic would be a note that you write to yourself. Uh, I've got terrible handwriting, so most people can't read my writing, so uh, that's the best way to think of it. I might get a slap on the wrist for that. Uh, th- that's it. So demotic comes from hieratic, and it's it's what uh, was used to write on these uh, papyri. So it sounds almost like kind of the difference between traditional Chinese characters and the simplified. Exactly. Between kanji, or even better yet, even the the kanji and the katagana, hiragana breakdown in Japanese. Yes, I will say yes. I don't know what those things are, but yes. (laughs) So what did they contain? They contained spells of all sorts, formula, prayers, hymns, and rituals. There's lots of gods. Some of them you've probably heard of. Osiris, Isis, Anubis, Zeus, Serapis. It has Greek, Egyptian, Jewish, Coptic, Babylonian influences, even a little uh, sprinkling of Gnostic and, and Christian. It is, to put it bluntly, an absolute magician's buffet. And it is so fantastic that it exists. There is something within them called the Theban Magical Library. And these are 14 papyrus rolls. Uh, They were probably written by one person. Some people have said that it was written by a collector or somebody interested in magic. It doesn't look like that. If you actually have uh, the translation of the Greek magical papyri, there's things that say this worked seven times or this worked eight times or do the usual. This is a working magician's scrolls. This is basically, it's it's a magician's magical journal, if, if you will. So... It was compiled in 200 AD to about 400 AD. Uh, the spells themselves, they, they date much further back, much, much further back. There's a gentleman by the name of uh, Gene D'Anastasi. He was a diplomat in Thebes, and he bought these scrolls somehow in Thebes. They are, to my money, the most interesting part of the, the Greek magical papyri. Uh, that's the, They have spells in there. A lot of them have the, the demotic, so they're, they're more Egyptian. Uh, as diplomats are wont to do, he sold them off to museums. And so that's why they're all over the world. We have segments of the Theban Magical Library within London, in Paris, in, in Leiden, in the Netherlands. So there's a lot of history of the translation of these texts. Uh, some of the history is kind of fucked up. They met with a lot of mishaps in translating, including things being bombed in World War II. Some of them were translated or published in about 1843 and 1853. I'm not going to go in too much into the translation history. If it's interesting to you, please, again, look it up. But in 1986, from the University of Chicago, Hans Dieter Betz did a translation of it. This is a book you can go into a store and you can actually buy. I think, well, I hope that most occult bookstores would have this for sale, but in my experience, very few of them do, which is, to me, insane because they are such an important document. So let's talk a little bit about the, the world that the uh, the Greek magical papyri came from. Magical Egypt. Now, I've already done an episode about ancient Egyptian magic, but I'd like to share a quick little quote from the Talmud. It says that when God created the world, he measured out 10 portions of magic. Into Egypt, he poured nine of these portions. Into the rest of the world, he only poured one. And I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about it. it Egypt is indeed a magical, magical place. Uh, what needs to be understand about Egypt is for a long period of time before these scrolls were written, Egypt was constantly being invaded. There was the Persians, there was the Greeks through Alexander the Great, uh, there was the Romans. That's why there's a ton of these strange traditions all packed within the Greek magical papyri. And these are the areas that I absolutely love when there's this strange transition from one culture or one tradition to another. I think, Matthew, you could probably agree with me. I, we had a conversation on Twitter about how I wish that there was more that we knew about when the Vikings started becoming Christian as opposed to pagan and what kind of magic that they would have when, when something like that happened. Can you speak a bit to that? Like, do you know if any, something yeah, like that exists? Actually, yeah, um, yeah. So the Norse were interesting in that they, 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 they didn't really care what okay. your god was or 
anything like that. Like as as it got more militant, yeah, there was pretty hard fighting between heathens and Christians, and I'm sure a lot of animosity. But in the magical world of the Norse, you can actually find around the time of anywhere conversion was happening, but specifically Iceland seems to be where we get most of the actual resources that have remained. You'll see charms that first reference Thor and asking him for strength and then go on to ask Jesus Christ for That's awesome. uh, his benedictions in the same spell. I fucking love that. They just, they didn't care. Yeah. Um, the, I find the whole phrase that a lot of dude bro heathens online seem to love is uh, your God is nailed to a cross. My God has a hammer. And I find that just thoroughly huh. gross and uh, <laughs> not at all what, the relationship was between those two religions and peoples. One of my favorite books of all time, The Long Ships by Fangs Bangstrom. Have you read it? I have not. No. Oh, you had to read it because it's it's about, yeah, a Viking who eventually becomes a Christian, but with still holding the, the Viking values almost, trying to grapple with the new Christianity that he adopted, forgiveness and this kind of stuff, but he still has the uh, berserker anger. It's just an amazing book. Fantastic book. I would recommend it to everybody, but I love what you said there, just kind of how they will list Jesus and then a Norris God. That kind of thing is, is definitely... A maintained within something like the Greek magical papyri. We have to un- also understand about this world is that with not just magic being throughout Egypt, there were scrolls everywhere. There were so many of them and many of them were burned. There's about, we estimate, 3 million papyri fragments all across the world. Only 2% of these have been translated. A lot of them are in really bad shape. And a lot of them have, as soon as somebody, some European most likely, found them, put them in a box, sent it to a museum, they've been stored away and they haven't been looked at since. It's absolutely crazy to me. 2%. And that seems like so much. As I said, a lot of them were burned. A lot of them are in bad shape. Augustus uh, himself, he ordered for 2,000 scrolls to be burned. We need to understand as well with the stuff that mostly interests me in the Greek magical papyri, uh, the Theban magical library. Thebes was a very strange, cool place. It, It had this weird idea of being the spiritual center of Egypt for a very long period of time. Uh, Alexandria became the bigger city and due to trade and whatnot and being on the Mediterranean, it was it was the new hotness. But the best way of trying to think about it is Europe now compared to America now. It's, that's Thebes is is old Europe. And, uh, we used to run the world. We used to be the, the thing that everybody got their culture from. And, uh, so uh, that's, that's a good way of thinking about it. So it's funny uh, you mentioned uh, Augustus. Like, I needed another reason to dislike Augustus. Um, (laughs) Dominique will tell you. Sorry, Dominique's my girlfriend who also talks with Doug on Twitter. We're all friends. We're all friends. And uh, she claims, she says we're a Antony and Cleopatra household. There we go. Caesar Augustus was uh, was an interesting chap, but th- there's stories of just people running around. Uh, Alexandria itself had an enormous Jewish population. I think at one point the population in Alexandria was 40% Jewish. I, I might get a slap on the wrist also for that. But uh, they they have these records of them being like just people, priests running around with scrolls all the time everywhere. So magic, again, nine portions poured into Egypt. Keep that in your mind when you look at these uh, these wonderful documents and uh, and the book, the Greek magical papyri. So, what is in it? Well, magic, obviously. <laughs> there is a, a a book called Techniques of Greco-Egyptian Magic by Dr. Stephen Skinner. He's a bit of a hero of mine. I've talked about him many times before. As I just mentioned, uh, there's spells, formula, prayers, hymns, rituals. There's actually much, much more than that. So let's let's go through what's basically in the book. You have amulets. You have evocationary bull scrying. I don't think I know any of the last three things you've said are. Evocationary bull scrying. So that's where you call in a god, you evoke a god, and then he helps you look into a bowl that either has water or water with oil on it or wine in it. Oh, and you're able to scry. <laughs> I heard bowl. 
<laughs> oh, I heard B U L L. I'm like bull scrying. Bull scrying. <laughs> what? First, that, remove the testicles that might be of the a bull. Most Texan thing ever, actually. Look into the magic bull. Um, but yes, calendrical considerations, defixiones. Defixiones are curse tablets or, or curses. They mm. would uh, they would write onto uh, either lead or some kind of a metal. A god's name would be on there. You'd curse somebody, and you'd either drop it into a well or put it into the river. Uh, they're still finding wells in Rome with the things in the bottom of them it's actually quite crazy and they're very cool might do an episode about defixiones one of these days you have evocationary lamp scrying there's face-to-face encounters with a god god's arrival and invocation spells about health invisibility there's hymns Uh, there's spells for foreknowledge and memory spells for love mysteries and initiation rites necromancy Mm, yeah that stuff (laughs) <laughs> There's Homeric magic and divination, Peredros, or having an assistant daemon. Very cool. There's demonic possession and exorcism, magical rings and gemstones, magical statues. Again, from my last episode about Egypt, they loved their statues. There's talismans, phylacteries. For those that don't know, phylacteries are things worn on yourself when you are doing magic or spells or rituals or rites. The best way to uh, to get people to think about this, I think it's called the, the Teflon, uh, Jewish uh, rabbis. They will have a, uh, a small box with, a, with scrolls written on it uh, on their forehead. That would be a phylactery. There's visions and dream revelation spells, prayers, herbs and plants. There's evil sleep, blindness and death, much, much more. So it's just chock full of these kind of things, which is absolutely wonderful. I just want people to realize the the Betts translation, the book that you can buy, it is not, 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 not a step-by-step guide as to how to do Greco-Egyptian magic. So uh, if you do buy the book and you have it in front of you, and you want to work with it, I just want to go through a couple of things. It might look very confusing, and indeed it is. The PGM is stuff that's mostly in Greek. It uh, has also the PDM, which is the stuff that is written in Demotic. The Greek stuff is mostly, you know, hymns and prayers, that kind of thing. The PDM is mostly Egyptian, so you're dealing with Egyptian gods. If it's listed in the book with capital Roman numerals, that means you're dealing with the PGM. If it has lowercase Roman numerals, that means you are dealing with the PDM or with the Demotic spells. So, Going on from there, it is indeed a little bit confusing. And Hans Dieter Betts, who was definitely not a magician, again, University of Chicago, he lists absolutely everything in the book as a spell. It's a spell for this. It's a spell for that. It's a spell, spell, spell. Stephen Skinner hates this. He absolutely hates the word spell. I don't mind it. I actually like it. Stephen Skinner has done a wonderful job in techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic for putting these spells in the right places or what exactly they are. So the highest number of kinds of spells within the PGM are amulets, talismans, gems, and statues. There's love spells in there. Uh, I wouldn't suggest anybody use the love spells in the PGM. (laughs) They're a bit ew and defixiones and curses, as well as scrying. Things with the lowest amount of space within the PGM are things like exorcism and necromancy, unfortunately. Besides money, this looks very familiar, especially to modern magicians. You have trying to see into the future, like tarot cards, you know, this kind of thing. You've got love spells. You've got people with crystals or amulets or talismans. So it's, in my opinion, the PGM is the the birthplace of modern magic, or at least the the time in which it was all compiled or these scrolls. The other thing that I, I mentioned about it being a workbook, yes, again, we are looking at definitely for segments of this text at somebody's magical journal. He writes in it, this is effective, or that this has worked six times. Most likely he was a uh, jobbing wizard. He would be a priest probably for a segment of the year, maybe three to six months. And then when he wasn't in the temples, he would be going around and making house calls and doing magic for people. So it's a really interesting way of thinking about it. How do we bring that gig back? Oh, but (laughs) man, I wish, I I truly wish. Well, you never know. If with things like this podcast really take off, uh, you never know. You never know. I think uh, there's going to be a flip at some point. I really, really do. 
Uh, another thing within the uh, the notebook is, uh, is things like add the usual, which is incredibly frustrating because we have no fucking idea what the usual is. They'll say, I'll do this spell. Uh, you you have this and then you, you, you scry and then you put this stuff on your face and then do the usual or add the usual. You're like, In no part of the Greek magical papyri is the usual actually laid out, which is part of the fun because it's a bit of a puzzle. Also in the PGM, you have animal sacrifice. Yep. You have a lot of working with weird parts of animals. Um, yeah. Um, they also have things in there where they say, like, put this on your eyes. I uh, wouldn't suggest that, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's all in there. Again, interesting document. One of the first things you will notice is that there are strange ingredients. Now, uh, I, I absolutely I love this stuff, and Stephen Skinner, in his books, Techniques of Greco-Egyptian Magic, goes through them. So for something, say, like uh, Blood of a Snake, that's actually the stone hematite. So there you go. Blood of uh, Hestia, that's chamomile. Pretty cool. If it uses the word eagle, that means uh, wild garlic. So that's just wild garlic. <laughs> My personal favorites are Kronos's spice, and that's uh, piglet milk. So a little, a little, a little pig's milk. I, now I don't really know if that's you're milking a piglet, which I don't think is possible, or if it is the milk you take away from a piglet uh, from its mother. I'm st I'm still kind of unsure as to that, but my absolute personal favorite is semen of Hermes, which is dill. That's right. Ah. So next time you're munching on your favorite flavor of potato chip, or if you're eating your favorite brined cucumber, just remember um, <laughs> that it's a uh, that's some semen of Hermes right there. So there you go. Uh, wonderful stuff. So I, I absolutely adore the ingredients. If you're having trouble with finding some of the ingredients, uh, Dioscorides, who was a Greek physician, has a lot of these herbs listed in, I think it's called De Materia Medica. That'll be up on the show notes. Another thing that's in the Greek magical papyri is dreams and scrying. Now they loved dreams and they loved to try and see the future. This was very, very important. It's another reason that I quite enjoy the Greek Magical Papyri. I'm going to read a little bit from, uh, I know you've all been waiting for it, so I'm going to read a little bit of, from the, uh, the Greek Magical Papyri, specifically with a dream spell. So this one is Request for a Dream Oracle from Besas. <clears throat> I call upon you, the headless god, the one who has his face upon his feet. You are the one who hurls lightning who thunders. You are the one whose mouth continually pours on himself. You are the one who is over necessity. Abrathio. You are the one lying in a coffin and having the side of the head an elbow cushion of resin, of asphalt, of the one whom they call Anuth. Rise up, daemon. You are not a daemon, but the blood of the two falcons who chatter and watch before the head of heaven. Rouse your nighttime form in which you proclaim all things publicly. I conjure you, daemon, by your two names, Anuth, Anuth. You are the headless god, the one who had a head at his face at his feet. Dim-sighted Basis, we are not ignorant. You are the one whose mouth continually burns. I conjure you by your two names, Anuth, Anuth. Come, Lord, reveal to me concerning the matter, without deceit, without treachery, immediately, immediately, quickly, quickly. So that's a little, uh, that's a little taste of the, uh, the PDM. That's pretty badass, is it not, Matthew? It really is. Like, <laughs> I, and it's funny because when you were describing the ingredients, I'm like, wow, Doug just totally demystified the entire wing of bat and eye of newt yeah. thing that magic has going for it. And Absolutely. then you just took it right back into the mystery, mystery with all of that. <laughs> I just, I, I, I could gush over the PGM for days. That's a little bit of dream magic there. And I also have uh, a little bit of the scrying. Now, this one is one that is a lot of people go to it. And it is basically one of my favorite scrying uh, techniques that I use. Oh, geez, I would say I would say monthly. So I, I'd like to go through that a little bit. So hail Anubis, Pharaoh of the underworld, let the darkness depart. Bring the light in unto me at my vessel inquiry, for I am Horus, son of Osiris, born of Isis, the noble boy who Isis loves, who inquires for his father Osiris Onomphris. Hail Anubis, Pharaoh of the underworld, let the darkness depart. Bring the light in unto me at my vessel inquiry to my spell here today. May he flourish whose face is bent down to this vessel here today until the gods come in, and may they 
tell me answer truly to my question about which I am inquiring here today, truly, without falsehood, and at once. Hail, Anubis, O creature and child, go forth at once. Bring to me the gods of this city and the god who gives answers today, and let him answer me at my question about which I am asking today. And then uh, you, uh, you open your eyes, or those of the boy, because you're scrawling with a boy, and with a vessel. Again, the vessel would probably have a liquid in it. And uh, you invoke the light, saying, Hail, O light, come forth. Hail, O light, come forth. O light, rise. O light, rise. O light, increase. O light, increase. O light, that which is without, come in. And then uh, when Anubis comes in and takes his stand, then you say to Anubis, Arise, go forth. Bring into me the company of the gods of this place. And then Anubis goes out, and at that moment, <laughs> at the moment named, he brings the gods in. And when you know that the gods have come in with you uh, while you're scrying, you say to Anubis, bring in a table for the gods and let them sit down. And when the gods have seated, you say to Anubis, bring a wine jar in and some cakes. Let them eat. Let them drink. And while he is making them eat and making them drink, you say to Anubis, will they inquire for me today? If he says yes, again, you say to him, the God who will ask for me, let him put forth his hand to me and let him tell me his name. And when he tells you his name, you ask him, the God, as to what you desire. And when you have ceased asking him that uh, what you desire, uh, you can send him away. Oh, that's a, that's a great one. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that spell specifically in a little bit. What else is in the PGM? There is a lot of god bullying. Remember in my episode about Egyptian magic, how they would threaten the gods. Uh, they would do something to make it that the sun wouldn't rise in the morning. There is god bullying in the PGM. You treat the gods like shit. The best way that I can explain it is treat them as if you were Adam Sandler in a 90s movie, right? Do it or you blew it. So that's, again, this is this is a holdover from ancient Egyptian magic. Uh, what else is in the PGM? You have a lot of rites. I think the most important rite within the PGM is something called the headless rite. Now, are you aware of the headless rite? You know, when you were talking about it, the thing with you were reading about the dreams and Ze it was clearly Zeus mm -hmm. being referenced in yep. a way. But it was a oh, headless one, and I was like, and I couldn't remember, like, is the headless ritual part of the PGM? Oh, yes. That's where it came from. Because I've seen it everywhere. Yep. But That's it. So, the uh, the headless one. Most people would know it as either Libra Samach, which is Aleister Crowley. He put it in the mm. beginning of Goetia. He called it yeah, the bornless one because Samuel yes. Mathers and Crowley were, they, uh, the Hebrew was a little bit interesting in how they translated things. Uh, resh does indeed mean head or beginning in Hebrew, but the translation is uh, achephalos, might be pronouncing that incorrect, which literally is Greek and it translates into headless. So I'm going to read a little small segment of the headless rite, and it is a fucking badass rite, and I, I do the headless rite about once a week. Uh, here we go. Subject to me all demons, so that every demon, whether heavenly or aerial, or earthly or subterranean, or terrestrial or aquatic, might be obedient to me, and every enchantment and scourge which is from God. I summon you, headless one, who created heaven and earth, who created night and day, you who created the light and the darkness. You are Osonomphris, you are the none who have ever seen, you are Eabas, you are Eapos. You have distinguished the just from the unjust, you have made female and male. You have revealed seeds and fruit. You have made men love each other and hate each other. I am Moses, your prophet, to whom you have transmitted your mystery celebrated by Israel. You have revealed the moist and dry and all that nourishment. Hear me. Great stuff. And it goes on from there. And it's one of those rites that I can't get enough of. And it's really starting to get its due now. And we've reclaimed it from Crowley and from the Golden Dawn and from Mathers. So that's a fantastic rite. Another rite that I, I tend to use quite a bit that involves Agathos Demon, the noble spirit or the good spirit. Uh, so here's a little slice of that. Come to me, you from the four winds, God, ruler of all, who have breathed spirits into men for life, master of good things in the world, hear me, Lord, whose hidden name is ineffable. The daemons, hearing it, are terrified. The name Babarek Arsem Fem Throthu, and of all the sun of it the earth, hearing rolls over. Hades, hearing is shaken. Rivers, seas, lakes, springs, hearing are frozen. Roots, hearing it, are split. Heaven is your head, ether, body, earth, feet, and the water around you, ocean. O Agathos Daemon, you are Lord, the begetter and nourisher and increaser of all. 
I, I really do love the the rights within the, the PGM, and I recommend them for absolutely everybody. If this is your jam, or if magic in general is your jam, you have to go for these things. Also contained within the Greek Magical Papyri are three books tucked in there. They might be a little bit weird, and they kind of stick out like a sore thumb. One is the, the Monas, or the Eighth Book of Moses. Uh, there's the Tenth Hidden Book of Moses. And there's something called the Mithras Liturgy, which is not appropriately titled because Mithras isn't in it. But it's a very interesting document. It's It seems like it is a father trying to bestow immortality to his daughter daughter which is very it's it's beautiful i reread it actually yesterday and i was quite shocked at how when i first read it i ah, okay that's interesting but reading it again there's something quite stunning and and wonderful in it again the egyptians were obsessed with the immortality and yeah it's it's really quite wonderful so what do i use the pgm for specifically uh, me uh, I use it a lot for powering up or charging things. The, a lot of the rites are really great for that. So, as I said, the, the language in them is very well placed. It doesn't seem haphazard. So it, it really ramps you up to be able to do that magic thing. Uh, another thing that I use it for is for consecration, specifically uh, something called the Helios Consecration. So I'll be uh, taking a ring or an amulet or a talisman, and I'll be doing a ritual for that. And uh, I enchant those objects. I'm bringing them alive. Again, this goes back to the Egyptians and their their statues and the, the way they saw the world. Refer back to my previous episode about ancient Egyptian magic. I also, every once in a while, I will use a defixione. Uh, I'm going to admit that uh, that's right. Yeah, I, every once in a while, I will curse somebody. So, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not something I'm overly proud of, but sometimes you got to, you know, you got to shake the world up a little bit. I'm not even. Sometimes it just has to happen. Sometimes you got you to gotta curse every once in a while. It's very effective, too. I, I will say that. I just want people to know. The fixiones, uh, not, just a, not just the evil eye. I say give yourself, uh, give yourself a tablet, put a nail through it, drop it somewhere. Water, probably the best, or a stream, or a uh, my personal favorite, spring water. You're asking the spirits of the dead to help you out. And where do we put the dead people? We put them in the ground. Where does water from the ground come from? That spring water? A, you know, figure it out. Figure it out, people. Have you heard of uh, war water? War water? I have not, no. So war water is uh, it's a hoodoo and kind of voodoo sort of, or maybe just straight hoodoo. Straight I'm not hoodoo. sure. But it is a, a technique where you take a jar and, yeah, you take spring water, um, a little bit of graveyard dirt, and rusty nails. For, yeah. Particularly for the Mars aspect. Got it. Is what yeah. I'm told. And you shake it all up, and you put some cayenne pepper in there, and then you basically smash it at the doorstep of the person you want to curse. I love it. That's a ton of Egyptian influences in there. Yeah. I might have heard of that, but yeah, no, the name War Water, I have not. But again, the Egyptians used to make curse pottery. They would write inscriptions along the pottery, and then they would smash it. So this is almost a near direct uh, yeah we've been doing this magic stuff for a long time people we really have i don't know why we've forgotten it over the last 175 years but uh let's bring it back let's let's really try to bring it back i i do a lot of scrying i find regular more popular forms of divination uh tarot and that kind of stuff they're okay but i prefer to get right in there especially with evoking a god and then trying to see glimpses of the future that's very important for me and i do a ton of that this might surprise people i use the pgm quite a bit to assist in dreams if you're a fan of the show you know that i find dreams are incredibly important and i think that it is maybe the best way of people to start to get into magic if the pgm is interesting to you there are so many spells in there for dreaming of gods to send you a dream or for you to send a dream to somebody else. I do something, here's a little slice of Doug, dream magic. I will do some of the spells, the dream spells within the Great Magical Papyri in the afternoon probably between a one and four, four o'clock, I'll go into a room, I will black out the windows, I will do a ritual, and then I will take what, I, I don't have a proper name for it, but let's just call it a PGM nap. I'm experimenting a bit. Again, if people know me, they know that I'm really big on hypnagogia which is the state that you're in right before you fall asleep. I have found it to be ridiculously, not ridiculously, but it's quite 
amazing in seeing glimpses of the future or future situations or future observances that you will have in your daily life. It's quite stunning. And the work that I do specifically with the rituals involved in the Greek magical papyri pertaining to dreams, it's mind blowing. So I do a ton of that. Dreams must have been very important to the world the PGM was written and to not utilize it is something that I think is not talked about very much when people talk about the PGM or magicians that work with the PGM. They don't really bring up dreams a lot and that's striking to me. So maybe someday I might do an episode about PGMs and dreams, but maybe a bit, I might, I might have you back for that, Matt. I think that this is maybe one of the more cooler things that is under-examined within the, the PGM. Love spells. Nope. 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 <laughs> nope, nope. Stay away. Uh, they, it's no, just, uh, I mean, I know some people that have, specifically people online that have done some PGL spell love spells. It's very of its time. I'll put it that way. Uh, you would be arrested or, mm, yeah, bad things would happen to you if you do some of the love spells in there. Amulets and talismans. I want to try and let people know what the difference between an amulet and a talisman is. An amulet is basically something that is very broad. It's for protection. The ancient Egyptians, most of their spells were apotropaic, and that means that most of the things that they did were to protect them from the environment or from things happening to them. An amulet would be something that you would wear every day to protect you. A, a lot of people I know use crystals this way. Uh, they will have a crystal with them. They'll bring crystals in their purse or in their pocket. That's the same thing. A talisman is different. A talisman is very specific, and it is for one thing. And it's not broad. It is for like a, a goal or, or an ambition. So that's the kind of the difference between those two things. I'd like to take this opportunity now basically to ask you, as somebody who dabbles in the magic, Matthew, is there a difference between gods and spirits? What's, what's your take on that? I think in a really functional sense, no. Gods are just spirits that got really big. Okay. In a sense. That's a horrible way to put it, but gods are just certain spirits that ended up becoming more important, in a sense, feeding more, right. and eventually sort of getting to the top of the food chain spiritually, I guess is the way you could put it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still trying to work out exactly what a spirit is. The best definition that I've come to at this point is that they are shapes with ambition, or forms that do not rely on one substance, but use different kinds of substances all the time. Which might sound like the whole 17th, 18th century of the idea of an ether, that all-pervasive ether that goes through things. Again, I don't think that there is one definition of spirits that really gets to me, but the longer I do this magic thing, I believe it was Gordon White who, who put it very eloquently. He said, the gods are in your head, but the spirits aren't. And mm. I know that you and I have talked about this before, and the fact that we think that spirits are embedded in our world, and that is totally incorrect. We're the ones that are embedded in theirs. And I once uh, I once put it to you in uh, via Twitter, and you were very ecstatic about this. Like, dude, I'm going to use this. And you're, everybody's totally <laughs> and welcome <I> <laughs> to. But just the best way to think about it is that we're the ghosts. Us human beings, we're, we're here temporarily. This is their world. They've been here for a long time. We're the specter in this this whole operation that we call life so yeah I've, i'm trying to still figure out that gods seem to be to me at least the aspects that we can identify of spirits and we try to personify them we bequeath these certain gleamings that we have of how spirits work and call them gods. I think that's one of the best ways that I have right now to think of them. And people would just be like, hogwash, that's that's utter bullshit. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm still working on this. I don't think that most magicians have a bang on, this is a definition of what a spirit is. Because I do think that magic is mainly, it's about spirit contact. <laughs> it is about this kind of stuff. Well, and going kind of to the Norse context that I'm embedded in, the gods aren't the first thing you go to. No, no. It's There's a kind of a, a hierarchy of you work up to them. They're kind of the big guns in a way. But the first things you go to are your own dead, right. your own ancestors. Absolutely. Um, then you start branching out to the spirits of your home and of your land. And then um, the other 
classifications, I guess you could say. We, we like to classify things all the time. Right. The elves, the dwarves, right. the, the greater, <laughs> everything else. And then finally, when nothing else works, you're like, okay, Thor, just fucking hit it. Right. <laughs> My last conversation that I had on the Arnomancy podcast, and Eric brought up something that he's he's not really a fan of the colonization of spirits and how they took old gods and gave them spirit names. White Christians just took over other people's gods and called them spirits. I, I didn't at the time want to, to hijack him. And maybe it's a discussion I'll have with Eric a little bit later or on another podcast. Uh, but to me, the, the spirits came first. They definitely did. This idea that some kind of spiritual colonialism occurred, that the Christians took pagan gods or Jewish deities and turned them into demons is a bit of a holdover from uh, Margaret Murray's uh, idea that this this actually happened. And uh, I, I'm just going to come out and say it. It's, it's completely wrong. It's 100% wrong. And it's one of those things that a lot of magicians uh, to this day get very wrong. So sorry. Judaic demonology predates Christianity. Uh, it was a Sumerian uh, inheritance, and even the Egyptians, I mean, I think a lot of them could roll demons into the idea of Set uh, and, and whatnot, but it's, it's something that we have to actually really realize now, specifically people that, that work with uh, demons or, or spirits, that, uh, yeah, this stuff came before the Christians, and it's, it's definitely a Mesopotamian a legacy, so... Just going to put that there. Demonology long predates Christianity. So, yeah, we, we have to get this Margaret Murray idea out of our heads. Completely. Completely. It, it's not that we took old gods and then made spirits out of them. I think it's the, we, we are honing down on the actual essence of the thing, if that makes sense. I think so, and, and this is the thing I've I've constantly thought about over the past few years. Um, before we got going, we were talking about Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman. Yes. American Gods is probably one of my favorite novels of all time. One of the best books. One of the best and, books. Uh, and it really, it really makes me wonder about the nature of spirits, especially locally. Right. I have my house spirit. Mm-hmm. I have my my land spirit or land white house white. Um, my land white is a tree right outside my apartment building that I've encircled with stones and pour out ale and barley to it. You know, on certain occasions, thank it. Now, is that spirit mm. a land white because that is the way that I interact with it, mm-hmm. or is that spirit purely local and has always been here in San Antonio, Texas? Right. So am I coming? Is it responding to me? I don't know exactly how to put this because it, it's such a weird concept. Like, right. Is it responding to me as a land white? Because that's the way that I come to it. I think we murder to dissect in a way, if that makes sense. Let the spirit be the spirit. You know, I think <laughs> let the spirit do the thing. I, I don't know if we should try to nail down or be too specific with them. What I love about the PGM is that the word spirit is brought up quite often, as are the gods, almost in the same sentence. You can kind of see that wonderful working with spirit uh, attitude that I think should be the basis of, of magic now. I'm not saying everybody needs to stay in their lane. To me, as I keep doing this whole magic shindig, that has become very apparent about uh, the importance and the necessity of having a spirit-based system of of looking at magic, at least to me. The single continuum with interiority is kind of where I come at from (laughs) this this whole thing. What would be some of the pitfalls that you'd have if you want to work with the Greek magical papyri? Because again... It's very tied to a certain time in history, written from 200 AD to 400 AD. What are the things you need to watch out for if this is interesting to you? You have to ask yourself, am I doing this correctly? Or should I remain faithful to everything that's in here? When it says I need to use this thing or rub this thing in my eye or get this certain ingredient... These are questions you need to ask yourself. But again, you need to realize that the world is not the same. Is there room to adapt within the PGM? I say absolutely. And one of the most wonderful things about 
the PGM is the puzzle-like nature of it and trying to figure out how to get these things to work, how to bring them back to life in some way, shape, or form, to try and keep it alive. Another thing that people need to realize if they want to do Greco-Egyptian magic is you can't just fuck about. You can't take, I don't know, some of the the strange symbols in the book and put it on the side of your bike helmet and be like, look, uh, this is going to protect me. It's like, (laughs) uh, no, that's, that's, that's not, that's not really, you're not doing PGM magic. You're not doing Greco-Egyptian magic if that's the way you want to think of it. Oh no, I just say this thing before I wash my hands. And then uh, when I go into this conference, then everybody's going to think that I'm the best person around. It doesn't exactly work that way. The thing that I want people to think about if they want to work with the PGM is that would the Theban magician approve? Would the person that probably wrote these scribes, if you were sitting in the room and you were going through how you're going to adapt one of these spells, would he say, I get what you're saying there, go forth? Or would he be like, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't get it. I want people to maybe think about that or even do one up. Maybe try and scry. Try to find this guy. Try to find this guy in this other realm. But I think that's very, very important. Have fun with it. And again, it is a very fun document for me. Maybe one of my favorite things. I use it constantly. I use it not daily, but weekly. Absolutely. Have fun with it, but you do have to take it a bit seriously. So remember, you're working with nine measures of magic when you're dealing with the PGM. So you have to be very aware that this is some crazy stuff you're working with. I'm gonna talk just for a little bit here about my experience with the PGM. I've been doing it for six, seven, eight years. Uh, More like seven years. Try to remain faithful is what I've learned. Again, uh, if some of the incense are things that you can't get in your area, Smell is very important to spirits, as I've said. Two magical tools that every magician should have and utilize are candles and incense. So if you can't get a certain kind of incense, what does the incense smell like? Smell is important. Is there something that also smells very similar? I try to be as smart in as many of the instances as possible. Uh, There might be uh, spells in there where it will say, use the blood of a snake to write the spell or something. Blood of a snake, again, is one of the ingredients. That's hematite. So I will try to work hematite in there. It's fun, right? Don't be discouraged by, oh, I don't have this shit that hasn't existed, this plant that hasn't existed for 400, 500 years. There's ways to jailbreak it. That's where a lot of the, the fun comes from the PGM, and it's powerful stuff. It really is. I think one of the most obs- what-the-fuck ingredients I've ever encountered, I believe it was, I want to say, uh, Jake Stratton Kent's True Grimoire. Okay. And it was, write this in the blood of a female sea turtle. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just looking at that like, where the fuck am I supposed to get that? Right. <laughs> so... Try to be uh, a little bit uh, smart about how you go about doing these things. So I debated whether or not to talk about this because it might scare some people. And this is not me trying to drum up some kind of sensationalist thing within my podcast. But of all the documents or things that I've worked with, nothing comes close to having strange paranormal shit happen uh, when I do Greco-Egyptian magic. And it is very powerful stuff. I just want people to know this. A couple of examples is one, uh, I did a wax effigy. My place is littered with candles. So there's wax around always. Uh, I made a little figurine and uh, it was. I did a, a ritual with it. And uh, when I woke up in the morning, I had a look at it and it was covered in ants. It was ju- It was swarming with ants. It's the same wax I use every day. Anyways, that's some weird shit. I have a picture on my wall that I have hanging by a nail, and I also use a Velcro to stick it to the wall. For some reason, when I do Greco-Egyptian magic, uh, that painting has come off the wall so many times, and yeah, it's like one of those things where, at one point I was like, I should set up a webcam just to see. For some reason, this one picture they go after and it's quite frightening uh, i've mentioned before in another podcast episode and this is an example of why not to fuck about i did a scrying not the one that i mentioned earlier with anubis but i did some scrying uh, while i was on vacation and i was staying at somebody else's house 
and I didn't have a scrying bowl and I didn't have my black mirror with me. So I decided to use my iPad and when it is turned off, it's a black reflective surface, you know, infinite depth. I didn't really get anything out of it. It was kind of murky. It wasn't really uh, that good. But immediately after that, some insane shit started happening in that house. Uh, appliances turning on and off. Uh, a, a piece of pottery that was sitting on a table just blew apart. Actual, like, explode, poltergeist explode. Non-stop. It was for a period of three days. It got to the point where the person whose house I was staying in was just like, what the fuck is going on here? And I just, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea why this is happening. So if there is a cautionary tale, realize that... I will say this now, of all the forms of magic that I've da I've had a dalliance with or, or worked with, nothing has more strange stuff happen than when I do Greco-Egyptian magic or when I work with the Greek magical papyri. So I'm just going to put that out there. It's good to know. So another thing I, I think that people need to, to register is that... Uh, it is work. It is a lot of work to do uh, the Greco-Egyptian magic, uh, finding things, um, trying to figure it out. But know this, as much work as you put into this kind of magic, you will get out of it. You really will. So most of the time, your efforts will be registered and they will be reciprocated. So that's a really cool thing. So use the Theban magician as an example. Follow his mind space and you can almost figure out how he saw things from the text alone. It, it's all in there, strangely enough. Well, it's not all in there, but there's gleams and aspects of it which are. And it's very, very necessary. It would be a very innocuous statement to say that this kind of magic was first chaos magic um, because it's just like a blending of Greek, Egyptian, Babylonian, Christian, Gnostic, uh, la -de blah It's just on and on. Uh, it seemed like it had a long tradition. It really did. And uh, some of the spells do definitely date before the scrolls were written. They were not playing fast and loose with it, and neither should you. So I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> uh, if all of this sounds good and you want to jump in, uh, here we go. Firstly, what do you got to do? Well, you have to buy the book, Hans Dieter Betts, The Greek Magical Papyri in Translation, Volume 1, Texts. Uh, we're still waiting for Volume 2. I don't think it will ever come out, but because, uh, uh, yeah, it's been, well, 86. That's, that's been a long time. But you can buy this book. Uh, something else that I would say, you need to own Stephen Skinner's Techniques of Greco-Egyptian Magic. It's very good. It's not a practical book. It's a way of applying context, and there's some comparison in there. Again, the two of the magical tools that I talked about that are extremely important for a magician, and especially somebody that's new to this kind of thing. So it's very academic. I'll put it that way. It was actually Stephen Skinner's thesis for him to get his doctorate, and he got it from writing techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic. There's some stuff in there that I don't exactly agree with. He overstates the case for use of magic circles within Greco-Egyptian magic. There is at no point listed in the PGM a circle drawn on the floor for protection. Uh, some would say that, well, that's just why you have the do the usual. The do the usual was the <laughs> thing. But they, there's so many other things in the book which are uh, mentioned. And this is something that Sam Block, who I will talk about shortly, mentions. Like they, they were very meticulous in what they wrote down. Yeah, there's the do the usual or add the usual. But at no point did they, did they have a circle there. So I don't really see it. But the, you do need, if you want to do this, I'd say the two texts that you need to have is uh, the Greek Magical Papyri in translation and get yourself a copy of techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic. And uh, the two go together. There's a great way of looking things up very quickly if you have Stephen Skinner's book. It's got things listed by spell, and then you have a little table. That, oh, my God. The tables in this book, Stephen Skinner, I love them, but constant tables. There's just nothing but tables. <laughs> but if, if, it's, if it's handy for you, uh, definitely get this book, and you can be able to look up all the scrying spells. It's bam, it's right there, and it's PDM or PGM, IV, uh, XIV or XII, that kind of thing, essential. Sam Block, 
who I just mentioned. He has a website called The Digital Ambler, amazing resource for Greco-Egyptian magic and other magic as well. He's big into geomancy, but his his Greco-Egyptian magic, he was the guy that I went to. His consecration rites are second to none. Uh, he really gets PGM magic. He is the best person to go to as far as this kind of thing is concerned. I will have a ton of show notes uh, that will link to certain rituals or rites that he talks about. Uh, also a small little essay that he talks about regarding animal sacrifice. So uh, Sam Block, the digital ambler, he is wonderful. Please go there. Give him some support as well. You can buy him a coffee. Uh, yes. Another person to go to for this kind of magic is Gordon White. He runs Rune Soup. He has a course on the PGM. Uh, you have to become a member. Now, I'm not being paid in any way, shape, or form by Gordon. I'm a member. Of, I'm a premium member. It's $10 a month. But if this stuff is interesting to you, he is a, and his course is very, very good. It's $10. You can get in there and do the thing in a month. You could even maybe cram in the Journeying course or the Grimoire's course or any of his other courses. And then you can duck out if it's not your thing. The Brune Soup premium member is a gift that keeps on giving. His magic is really my jam. Like he, Gordon gets it. I think better than anybody else alive at this moment. Other books. There's a book that goes through the Coptic side of the PGM or Greco-Egyptian magic by Michael Cicitelli. It's called the Book of Abrasax. I don't use it too much, but it's there. There's also a book by Tony Myers Wiki called Greco-Egyptian Magic. It's okay. He gives these weird planetary attributions in there. It's more practical than any of the other books. So, yeah, I, I would suggest it. I would give it a 6.5 out of 10. It's a good uh, it's a good resource, so Greco-Egyptian magic. We also have Stephen Flowers, who I think you're a little bit acquainted with, are you not? <laughs> first book on magic I ever bought. Really? Yeah. I think you were telling me that. The first book on magic was a book called Hermetic Magic by Dr. Stephen Flowers. Now... Mm. I Where would do we go with Dr. Flowers? <laughs> well, you have to understand that he's got his own way of coming at uh, what he considers hermetic magic or the things in the PGM. Basically calls himself a left-hand path magician. A lot of his stuff deals with uh, set. It's okay. If you do want to get that book, it's readily available. There's things to like in it. There's also things that I don't like in it. Uh, pick out the good stuff, discard the rest. And uh, finally, uh, Jake Stratton Kent. He is big on the Greek magical papyri, and I will talk a bit about him in a little bit. We're coming to the end here, and I did something for the first time uh, yesterday because the PGM is one of my favorite things in the world. And somebody who I went to constantly when I was doing this kind of magic was Sam Block uh, from the Digital Ambler. I sent him a direct message through Twitter basically asking him, why is this fascinating to you? And uh, he replied, and he's a great guy. He's very kind. We, we talked for about an hour, and he was overly polite and uh, very caring. So I, want, I, I asked him, why is this stuff important, or why did you find it fascinating? And this was his, uh, his response. He said, I think the main draw is that it's just a draw for me. You know how everyone seems to find their own path or eventually settles on something that just clicks best with them? That's kind of like that with me with PGM stuff. Call it a past life connection if you want. I don't. But it's not a bad way to think about it. It suits me like swimming does Michael Phelps. It does dovetail extremely nicely with my classical hermetic studies, that's for sure. Not an exact match. As you know, neither the PGM nor the hermetic canon were centralized. But it's an excellent thing to dive into. Besides the sheer age of it and the sheer power that radiates from it, there's also this puzzle-like aspect to it, a sense of magical archaeology come mist puzzle of putting the pieces back together. Some of it just can't be recovered anymore. A lot of this is tech for which the original connections are lost permanently, but the framework and general live-wiredness of it all still exist. It's just a matter of reverse engineering and finding substitutions where possible and necessary, and no more than that, to get things working again. While I despise the notion of Atlantis being a real place, the sentiment of recovering long-lost technology is very much a thing for me with the PGM. 
Also, just the aesthetic of it. It's brilliantly exotic without being unfamiliar, and still plays nicely with so much of what is modern Western magicians do because it's, in many ways, an ancestor to quite a lot of it. While being exotic, it's also in some ways time and place independent. Not all of it for sure, and we could never, ever deny the Egyptian and Greek and Hebrew and Gnostic and Christian elements of it, but so much of it does the same thing as a general hermetic framework does for religion. It can blend and meld and fit into so many places. That is extremely well put, and thank you again, Sam, if you ever listen to this, for, for speaking to me. And yeah, for me... This is the birthplace of modern practical magic, right? We are in some small ways doing PGM magic, but I always want to go back to the source, and this is it. It's all right there. You can see it. You can feel it. You can hold it in your hands. You can read it. Now, no one owns magic, but I feel I need to nail my colors to the mast here. (laughs) So the episode that I did with Eric Arneson, about the fourth book of occult philosophy, I talked about the Western magical tradition being grimoires. It is the Western magical tradition. This is something that a fellow by the name of Jake Stratton Kent is all about. He wrote a series of three books called Encyclopedia Goetica. The first is one that you've talked about not too long ago called The True Grimoire. The second is Geosophia. And the third is The Testament of Cyprian the Mage. These are incredibly important books. I wouldn't suggest them to a beginner, but if you have dabbled around in magic and you know the name of a lot of interesting books, uh, the books that I like, it is a fantastic work. Its arc is unreal. And I think in a hundred years time, we will still be talking about him. But the major thesis of these three books or the Encyclopedia Goetica is this. The grimoires represent a survival of primarily ancient pagan occult and religious practices, which only in the last 600 years has Kabbalah and Christianity, with help from Neoplatonism, been applied as a facade, probably to avoid persecution in some respects. And for some reason, this facade has just stuck. There are things in the PGM that look incredibly grimoiric, uh, specifically in the chapter of the Ars Almadel uh, in the True Grimoire, and how the scrying ritual there is very familiar. Indeed, it looks like the shape of many of the spells, particularly scrying, within the PGM, in a way point to the fact that the grimoire tradition is a survival of this odd comix of traditions. Uh, The Greek, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Jewish, all of them. So this is fascinating to me, and that's why I absolutely adore the PGM. Of course, these traditions go back much further than the PGM, but it is in these papyri that we see them all come together. So to me, magic looks mostly Greco-Egyptian, more so than anything. Now, Stephen Skinner has this argument as well. He is on side with Jake Stratton Kent. To me, the documents themselves, this is the Indiana Jones shit that I signed up for when I wanted to do magic. This is it. We have these scrolls. It's tough to see the evolution of magic otherwise, right? For me, at least. And of course, as soon as you get into Greco-Egyptian magic, I think that you'll come to maybe the same conclusions. Of course, there are other things. But once realized, your idea of what magic actually can be changes forever. Forever. There is no going back. But speaking of going back, we do not live in the same time or circumstances that these scrolls were written, but contained within them are the same desires, ambitions, insecurities, thoughts, and goals that you have now. It would be a shame to not utilize these amazing documents and the spells, rites, and rituals within them. Their existence is miraculous. And that's the PGM. Matthew, Thank you. You made it. <laughs> it's been a fantastic ride. So what do you think? You think you want to give uh, Greco-Egyptian magic a crack? Absolutely. And uh, definitely in the more uh, in-depth and uh, going back to the basics way that the PGM represent versus the whole Golden Dawn polemic kind of way. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm ready to get back, really dig deep. Would I suggest it for the beginner? If you're bold. I say yes. Like if you if you have not cracked a single magic book in your life, and this sounds interesting to you, man, 
I I tip my cat to you. I pop a champagne bottle and I wish you the best of luck because it's some it's some great stuff, but it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of work and bless you. Bless you, but it's a great place to start. If uh, it, you will have you will have most of the things pretty much well set up, all of the great uh, magical metaphysics and epistemologies and ontologies and all those other uh, $3 words there. But uh, no, I recommend Greco-Egyptian magic for absolutely everyone. So with that, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, head to whatmagicisthis.com. There you will find links to show notes. I go out of my way for those show notes, guys. There's, uh, there's not going to be a ton for this one, unfortunately, because it's all kind of contained within Skinner's book and within uh, Hans Dieter Betz's book. But I'll have a lot of stuff to uh, the Digital Ambler, Sam Block's uh, website. Uh, yeah, he's a fantastic resource. I've used him constantly uh, for my practices. Uh, also on my website, you'll find a way to subscribe to iTunes, to Stitcher, to Google Play, to YouTube's on there, Spotify. If they've got podcast guys, I'll be listed on my website. There's a little button. If you have an Android device, you can just click that and it'll get you subscribed. Also on whatmagicisthis.com, you will find uh, links to my Twitter account, which I'm getting much better at, to my Instagram account. I have no idea how to use that thing but I'm trying to get better at it. And my Facebook account, which is more of an afterthought. Guys, if you have questions, please reach out. That is how Matt got a hold of me. He sent me a wonderful, I, re I remember your first direct message to me. You basically said, hey man, uh, a lot of these other magic podcasts, they're, they're a bit stuffy or they're a bit meh. You said that you hit the nail on the head. And that, that totally stuck. And since then, uh, we, we talk uh, quite a bit on, on Twitter, do we not? Yeah, <laughs> so, almost daily, I think. Uh, really? Oh, jeez. Perfect. Guys, if you have some questions, please reach out. I will answer at this point. Uh, that's why I'm doing this. It really is. And I, I absolutely adore it. And I love sharing it with everybody. In some ways, I wish I was doing this five years ago. But mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Sam Block said to me, the best time to start was yesterday. And the second best time is now. So I'm doing it. If I might plug you on your own show. Please do. Go ahead. Um, guys, Doug's show, if this is your first episode, go back, find something that pops for you that you want to learn about, click it, and start listening. Doug presents everything in such a way that is, it's for the beginner, but I've been doing this for nearly 20 years, and I'm enraptured, and I'm still learning something with every single episode. So... Doug is for everyone. Oh, stop it. Stop it. I'll keep going. Oh, no, you're done? Okay, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that is very kind of you to say. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for always being a, one of those guys that lets me know when you enjoy something or you're learning something. That's, that is why I'm doing this. I, there's some kind of teacher thing within me. My mother was a teacher. I don't know what it is. But, uh, yeah, I want, uh, I want this to be something that people really enjoy and they learn from. That's the most important thing. And it allows me to share. I love to share. So any questions you guys have, fling them my way. I promise I will respond. Uh, if you also enjoy my podcast, guys, leave me a rating either on iTunes or any of the other platforms. Just say, you know what? I really enjoy Doug's show. The little star click thing, that's good too. But uh, you know what's uh, even better than that? Just writing a little thing. You know, I love this show. And that's it. That's the show on the uh, the PGM. And thank you, Matt, for uh, going through this with me. Uh, I could talk about this for hours. I definitely would love to have you back if we do another PGM episode because there's so much in there, man. It's just, it's unceasing for me. The hardest part of doing this episode was trying to figure out what not to talk about. It really was. And I think I mentioned well, that too. Well, I hope if you have me back, when you have me back, I hope. When, when, absolutely. Um, I have some PGM experience under my belt. And get, we can compare notes. Absolutely. Get in there. And uh, there's wonderful teachers, the people that I've mentioned. The best way to learn is to do it yourself, make your mistakes, and learn from them. That is how we learn. It's wonderful to have a little guiding light. Also, even more so to get the shovel in your hands and do some, some digging of your own. Let's do some excavating. Try to figure that puzzle out. Very important. And it's about your journey. I, everybody, this stuff is about your journey. Yes, get that right. And please, please, please go forth and do it. And with that, uh, that's the end of the program. We're going to end this show with the post-show quid pro quo. And in this instance, I get to ask Matthew a question. Matthew, are you ready? I have been ready for this the whole show. Okay, I'm perfect. I'm excited to see what you're going to ask. It's a pretty easy one, but uh, I think you're going to like it. Matthew, what is your favorite ghost story? My favorite ghost story? Um, I believe 
And I'm not sure it's exactly a ghost story. It's one I've mentioned to you before. Was first uh, I found it first in a book by Three Hands Press, Language of the Corpse, and it mentions a Icelandic sorcerer who had it out for some family, particularly some woman, and he created what is called ascending, um, which is using the corpse of typically an animal because if it was a, if it was a human corpse, it would be a draugr. Right. Which is the reanimated corpse of a human. Uh, but yeah, it uses any sort of animal that you reanimate and then send after someone. And in this case, it was a bull. A bull. And it, a bull. Yes. Not, not a bull. No. <laughs> We've already had that mistake. Uh, but yes, a male bull, B U L L. Perfect. Uh, of massive size, dragging its own bloody skin behind it. Cool. And this thing followed the woman around. It would toss her around. It would gore her. And the magician died without turning it off. And when her descendants traveled to Canada, it followed them. It Uh, followed uh, the descendants of this woman. As they do. And there's apparently, there have been tales of this bull running around rural Ontario, dragging its bloody skin behind it, looking for the descendants of this woman. I absolutely love it. Oh, that's amazing. The Ontario Bull. I had never heard of that Essentially, before. Essentially, yeah. I love ghost stories. They're my absolute favorite. Matthew, this has been awesome. I hope It's been great, sir. I, I hope that uh, sometime in the not-too-distant future, we will talk again. I would love that more than anything. Looking forward to it. Perfect. And that's the show, everybody. So I really hope you enjoyed listening. Uh, I want you to tune in again. Let's do this uh, this whole magic talking thing, uh, mostly me talking, but uh, we'll do it again in uh, <laughs> 10 days' time. I'll be a little bit better with the release schedule next month. Uh, this one was a bit weird. Uh, anyways, uh, I should be appearing on another podcast shortly on the Prague Magic podcast hosted by Keats Ross. So watch out for that. I will link to it when it appears. I think we're going to be talking more about me as a person, and uh, which is terrifying. That's terrifying. My go- that's my ghost yes. story. Talking about myself. I'm, I'm Canadian. We're, we just stay off into the background. We're like, eh, we're over here. We're we'll give you like that half-assed wave, like eh, hey. Huh. But uh, should be fun. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to What Magic Is This? My name is Douglas Batchelor, and uh, stay luminous, and we will talk at you soon. Uh, buy the BGM. Just buy it. Just do it. Just cut. Please. It, it saved my life. It really did. Please buy it. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.